This is Duke University. Not unpleasant. Hello, everyone. I'm Christine Kersley, and on behalf of the Health Law Society, the American Constitution Society, and the Federalist Society, thank you so much for being here today. I'll introduce our moderator, Professor Bloker, and he will get us started. Great. Uh, thank you, Christine, and uh, thanks to ACS, FedSoc, and the Health Law Society for hosting this uh, fantastic event. It's a really great way um, to kick off the year. Uh, as Christine said, my name is Joseph Bloker. I teach constitutional law here, and I am today sitting in for Professor Young, uh, who is sick and at home enjoying the benefits of health insurance and health care, um, <laughs> which is appropriate enough, um, because today we're going to be talking about the Patient Protective and Affordable Care Act um, and the Supreme Court decision that upheld it as constitutional. Some of you guys probably know a lot about the ACA. I'm just going to give a quick overview of it and the court's decision and then turn it over to this fantastic panel that we have. The ACA was signed into law in uh, March of 2010, um, as uh, many of you know, by President Obama. The basic goals of the legislation were really uh, primarily twofold. The first was to reduce the cost of health care, um, which has been projected to uh, consume something on the order of 20% of the national budget uh, by 2018. That's a lot of money, something on the order of $4.4 trillion. Um, and also, secondarily, or uh, maybe primarily, to reduce the number of people living without health insurance. Um, and that uh, is a number which has been projected um, uh, somewhere on the order of 19% of the non-elderly population, amounting to something like 50 million people uh, in America. So the ACA seeks to achieve those goals in a lot of ways, um, some of which the panelists still talk about. One is through an expansion of Medicaid, um, uh, which I think um, Ashish is going to talk about. Another is through something that's been called the individual mandate, um, uh, which uh, uh, also referred to as the minimum coverage provision, which I'm, I'm sure someone on the panel will address. Now, those of you who are in con law now or have taken it before know that Congress can only pass legislation pursuant to its enumerated powers. So the big question for the constitutionality of the ACA was whether it falls into one of those enumerated powers. The three leading contenders throughout the litigation were uh, regarded as the tax power, the commerce power, and the necessary and proper power, and the panel certainly will talk about those. Uh, the Supreme Court, as you know, upheld the ACA in an interesting um, and somewhat divided opinion relying primarily on a theory of the tax power, indeed one that was uh, remarkably similar to a theory of the tax power described by Professor Siegel uh, in an article he wrote with Bob Cooter last year. Um, that seems like as good a segue as any to introduce the panel. Um, uh, first, uh, our first panelist is going to be Mr. Um, Ashish Agarwal. He comes to us from Ogletree Deacons, um, where he divides his time between the Indianapolis and Washington, D.C. offices. Um, he served as special counsel to John McCain in, 20, uh, uh, in the 2008, um, and he was a deputy assistant attorney general in the Department of Justice um, for, I think, four years um, during the Bush administration. Um, he's a graduate of the University of Chicago Law School. He's been quoted um, um, many times in national uh, media regarding the ACA, um, and I understand cited by the Supreme Court um, as well. Pretty awesome. <laughs> so we'll talk about that. <laughs> Professor Stephen Sachs, clerk for the Supreme Court, um, has not yet been cited by it to my knowledge, um, uh, but he's only been out for about a year and a half, so um, you know, time will tell. Uh, he teaches civil, civil procedure and conflict of laws here at Duke, um, clerk for Chief Justice Roberts. Um, a few years ago, he's a Rhodes Scholar. He was executive editor of both the Yale Law Journal and the Yale Law and Policy Review. Um, uh, as part of the Law and Contemporary uh, Problem Symposium last year, he wrote an article called The Uneasy Case for the um, Affordable Care Act. Finally, Professor Neil Siegel is a professor of law and political science and co-director of the program of Public Law, which hosts a lot of the events you guys will be attending um, while you're here. He clerked for uh, Justice Ginsburg, um, acted as special counsel to then Senator Joe Biden, um, and served as a fellow in the office of the U.S. a Brissa fellow in the office of the U.S. Solicitor General. I think it's not an exaggeration to say that over the last two years, he's devoted about as much time as energy as any scholar in the country to the ACA. And as I mentioned earlier, he co-authored with Bob Cooter an article which may have been um, part of the roadmap for the Chief Justice's decision. Um, the Supreme Court set aside the better part of a week for oral arguments in this case. We've got about an hour, um, so I'm going to ask everybody to keep to about 10 minutes. Um, afterwards, I'll moderate questions, so um, please get them ready, and I'll, I'll call on you when we're done. Thank you, Professor, for that uh, wonderful introduction and also for the invitation to Duke Law School. I should start out by saying that uh, while I've never been uh, to Duke, this is my first time, a Duke is very much ingrained in my recent memory. In uh, 2010, um, I had the privilege of uh, attending the uh, Final Four, which was in, in Indianapolis. So I went to the Final Four and also the championship game where Duke beat my 
hometown uh, Butler Bulldogs, uh, cr <laughs> crushing the hopes of the underdog, but I, 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 it was a great success. A, a slightly more enjoyable moment for me came uh, the following year when uh, Butler was again in the national title game uh, against UConn, and although Butler lost that game, there, there was one moment that brought a smile to my face. Uh, in the second half, uh, CBS panned the crowd, and there was one lone Butler fan holding up a sign saying, hey, everyone, where's Duke? So I did, uh, <laughs> I, I, I did like that. Uh, I'm going to be talking mainly about uh, the Medicaid issue, which is um, uh, the issue that I wrote an amicus brief on uh, for the Supreme Court. In some ways, might uh, be the most important uh, part of the court's decision, both for the short term and the, and the long term. So uh, just to start out, by, by way of background, as, as everyone knows, um, in our federal system, uh, Congress cannot tell the states uh, to do much of anything. Congress cannot tell the states uh, to, you know, to enact a law, to, um, uh, to, to build certain highways. Uh, but what Congress can do is incent the states using its spending power. So, for example, Congress can say, hey, states, if you will raise your drinking age to 21, we will uh, make available to you several million dollars in highway funds. That's something that uh, uh, Congress has been held to, to, to be able to do. Um, the, the problem uh, could be that um, in certain instances, Congress uh, uses its power uh, past to the point at which pressure turns into coercion. That sort of dicta comes from you know, a series of cases from the New Deal in which Congress uh, w was found to have acted within its powers, but the court felt that Congress might be pushing the envelope and using its financial strings in a way that could be viewed as coercive. So this came to be known as uh, the coercion doctrine. And any of you who you know, have kids or teenagers or have ever been a kid or a teenager know that, um, you know, well, with purse strings comes a certain amount of power and that, you know, sort of along, along the lines of a species of duress, at some point that, um, that, that coercive power can effectively eliminate your, your free will. Now, the problem going into this case is that although there was some very nice dicta, you know, in several cases going back to the 30s and more recently in, in the 80s, the Supreme Court had never struck down a law under this coercion doctrine. And in the Affordable Care Act litigation, none of the lower courts had struck down a statute under, under this theory. And so some people were actually uh, quite surprised that the court even granted cert um, on, the, on the Medicaid issue because it had never been accepted by any court anywhere. Well, uh, to understand why the court uh, uh, took this case, took it up this issue, it's important to understand both the structure of Medicaid and its financial impact on the states. So Medicaid, as you may know, is actually a voluntary uh, partnership between uh, the states and the federal government. And the way it works is that uh, uh, the states agree to provide uh, you know, medical care, basic medical care for you know, very low income individuals, other classes of individuals. And in exchange for that, uh, Congress funds anywhere from 50 to 83 percent of the state's Medicaid costs. And uh, for many years, uh, most states you know, opted into the Medicaid program, not all of them. Until the early 1980s, Arizona uh, was not part of the federal Medicaid program. So it truly was, it truly was a voluntary program. Now, what the Affordable Care Act did was uh, well, two, two things of note. One is what it said to the states is, we want you to um, expand your Medicaid roles and provide coverage to new classes of individuals. And the, the effect of that would have been to require the state to expand their Medicaid coverage to roughly 15 to 20 million individuals. And in exchange for that, we're, go we're going to fund you, we're going to fund a large part of that expansion. In fact, we're going to fund up to 90% of that expansion. Um, it was still going to be an expensive proposition for the state. So even with the additional money that they were going to be getting from Washington, the aggregate costs for states over you know, roughly a decade or so was going to be $120 billion. So we're still talking about a lot of money for the states. So that was the carrot. Now the stick was, um, uh, was the, the size of a sequoia. What the stick was is um, if you state do not agree to expand your Medicaid rules, and continue in Medicaid, we are going to cut off all of your Medicaid funding. We're not just only going to deny you the, the funds that would go to expand your Medicaid rules, we're going to deny you all Medicaid funds. Now, to, to understand um, why this was important, um, I'm, going to, um, I'm going to paraphrase the Vice President and say that uh, Medicaid is a big effing deal. Um, jo join me for just, just a minute in, in putting on your, your green eye shades and, and looking at just, just a handful of numbers. Um, 
every year the federal government transmits to the states something like $550 billion. 42% of those dollars are for Medicaid. Um, the three biggest categories of federal outlays to the states are Medicaid, transportation, and education. The federal government gives states twice as much money for Medicaid as for transportation and education combined. Every state in the country gets from one to five billion dollars in Medicaid. One in five Americans receives some form of assistance from Medicaid. If Medicaid was completely cut off from Washington, um, states would have to raise taxes significantly to compensate if they wanted to keep a comparable program. In Michigan, for example, Michigan would have to raise taxes by 88% if they were to uh, have to replace all federal dollars uh, with state dollars. Um, an alternative, just cutting off medical care. Um, if you were to do that in Nevada, there would be something like 20,000, you know, sort of mothers who are, this, this comes from, you know, Nevada paper, something like 20,000 mothers would be denied, you know, you know prenatal care. So, um, it's, uh, so me 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 Medicaid is a big deal. So, uh, when this came to the Supreme Court, they, they looked at the size and the scope of Medicaid, and what they said was, you know what, states really don't have a meaningful choice um, in their ability to turn down Medicaid funds. Um, this was a decision that actually received seven votes, um, including some of, the, some of the more liberal justices signed on to this part of, uh, you know, this part of the federalism decision. Um, and I think it's going to have important, um, short, both short-term and long-term uh, implications. Over the short term, as you've probably seen, a number of states have already announced they're not going to um, expand their Medicaid roles and, and opt into Medicaid. You know, Texas, Louisiana, uh, Oklahoma, a few other states. Um, this is very much an issue um, in the political campaigns, some gubernatorial elections around the country. So if those states, you know, if a, the Affordable Care Act continues to be impl implemented and these states continue to, to uh, opt out, it's really going to throw a monkey wrench into the planning of uh, the Department of Health and Human Services and how they envision um, the, the act being implemented. Now, over the long term, I think that uh, the Medicaid decision could very well um, have a significant impact on how Congress uh, structures future outlays to the states. I think um, Congress is going to be very reluctant going forward to structure a law such that, in a way such that it would deny states um, all funding if they if they opt out of uh, you know, if if they opt out of a program or if they decline to go along with an expansion and we don't know exactly you know where the line is and this is a point that was made by Justice Ginsburg in her dissent you know we know that it's okay for a state to, to deny to for a state to be denied five percent of uh, highway funds if they refuse to do something that's South Dakota versus Dole but it's not okay to deny a state a hundred percent. Of funds, so well, you know what? What exactly is the line? Uh, you know, we don't know yet. That's to be determined by future cases. But I think that we are going to see quite a few of those. Now, um, I'd like to briefly touch on um, two other concerns uh, that I have um, with the Affordable Care Act decision before I before I turn it over. <laughs> And I say this with all, with all due respect to Professor Sachs' for, former boss, Chief, Chief Justice Roberts. Uh, I, I think there, 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 there are at least two aspects of the decision that I think everybody should find troubling, whether you agree with the ultimate outcome or not. I think the, the first part of, of the decision that I find troubling is the sense that it is acceptable for the court to uh, rewrite a statute to uphold its constitutionality in a way that's fundamentally inconsistent with the public's understanding of what the law was when it was enacted. So um, as you know, and as Professor Sachs will talk about, um, uh, when it was originally passed, you know, the White House and President Obama firmly denied that it was a tax. Um, it was absolutely not a tax. And I, I believe it was um, Judge Vinson in the Florida litigation leading up to the Supreme Court decision who said that, you know, you can't try to defend the constitutionality of this law on the basis that it's a tax when you have been out front, um, Department of Justice, and denying that it was a tax. You know, you know, I think he used the term Alice in Wonderland to describe that argument. So now we have a situation in which um, the Supreme Court has, in fact, upheld the law um, on a basis that was um, expressly denied by its, uh, by, by its drafters. Um, I think we can all agree with Chief Justice Roberts when he says that it's an appropriate judicial function to try to uphold a law 
uh, to try to interpret a law in a way that um, upholds constitutionality. Absolutely. I think we also agree with the chief, as I think the joint dissent agreed with the chief, that it's um, that the law would have been um, uh, constitutional had it been designed uh, to be a tax. I don't think even the joint dissent denies that power. But for the chief to effectively rewrite the law in a way that's um, inconsistent with what the public's understanding was, I think does a disservice to really the concept of representative democracy. I don't think that the chief chief's decision um, could be seen as sort of deferring to the, uh, you know, you know tr deferring to the notion that, you know, the political branches should, uh, should be making these decisions, when in fact what the political branches enacted was not consistent with the public's understanding. So that, that's point one. Point two is I think that we should all be, ha have some concern about how, about some of the aftermath of the decision and what we're hearing happen at the Supreme Court level. As you've all probably seen by now, there have been you know, quite a few you know, blog postings and rumors out there indicating that um, the Chief Justice Roberts um, changed his vote and that he may have changed his vote um, out of concern about the, you know, basically the integrity of, of, the, of the court. Um, you know, some might say that um, the that the chief was, um, you know, was perhaps bullied by um, by the political branches. Now, I certainly don't know whether that happened. I, I hope it didn't, but um, I think there should be some real concern that there is that perception out there that it is possible to basically, you know, intimidate the Supreme Court, and that by qu saying that. It, hey, Supreme Court, unless you rule one way, your legitimacy is going to be questioned by the political branches. I think that's something that should be of concern. We've seen several cases within you know, the past you know, 20 years that, ra that uh, had significant political overtones. Obviously, you know, this case, you know, Bush versus Gore, going back to you know, when I was in law school, it was the Paula Jones case that had all sorts of you know, political overtones about whether the president could be sued in, sued in his individual capacity. I think going forward, Whoever is in the White House, whoever is in the minority, I think you're going to see an effort by um, probably by partisans on both sides to try to persuade the court in ways that we as lawyers and future lawyers would rather not see. I think we should all uh, you know, believe, like to believe, and convince laymen that there is something more to the law than just ideology and pure power and trying to preserve one's own power. And I think, unfortunately, some of the reports coming out of the aftermath of the Affordable Care Act decision um, leave some questions as to whether that, in fact, is the case. Steve? Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much all to, to all of you for coming and to the groups for hosting us. Um, I guess I should start with, uh, with two disclaimers. One that, um, you know, Lord knows I don't speak for my uh, former boss, <laughs> um, and I certainly have no inside information on any of this. Um, and um, the second, I think, uh, yeah, the, the, the title of the, uh, of the uh, session I saw was, you know, it's constitutional, comma, what now? Um, and I would say to everyone, you should take that with at least a little grain of salt and that your con law courses should already have taught you that something being constitutional and the Supreme Court saying it's constitutional are not necessarily the same thing. Uh, saying does not always uh, make it so. Um, so what I want to talk about are the things other than the Medicaid uh, portion of the opinion, which I agree are probably the most significant um, for sort of future development of the law and also for future policy concerns. Um, I want to start off by tackling the question sort of from the, the merits of the uh, individual mandate question, what did the court actually hold? Um, and this is not as easy a question as you might think. Um, the way that the votes broke down, you had Chief Justice uh, Roberts um, hold, uh, arguing that um, the individual mandate, the obligation on everyone, placing everyone under a legal duty to buy health insurance, could not be supported by the government's power to regulate commerce among, uh, with foreign nations, among the several states, and with the Indian tribes. Nor was it necessary and proper to carrying that power into execution. Um, you had four dissenters who didn't join his opinion, but agreed with him on those points. Then you had Chief Justice Roberts saying that the mandate could fairly be read in the alternative as a tax, and you had four other justices who joined him on that point, making that point the opinion of the court. Um, and then you had uh, the question of you know, uh, the, the Medicaid issues on which you had a different split. But with your question of the individual mandate, normally when the court splits that way, we try and find the narrowest ground that commanded the majority, but that's not 
entirely clear what that ground is here. You certainly know that in terms of the construction as a tax, there were five votes for that. But there were five votes for striking down the mandate under the Commerce Clause. It's just not all of them joined the judgment. Um, and normally under something called the Marx Rule, it becomes difficult to figure out what exactly the holding is when you don't have five votes who all line up on the same side. Take, for instance, the, the uh, Apodaca case involving unanimous jury verdicts. There you had four justices saying that state and federal jury rules have to be the same, so both of them are unanimous. You had four justices saying state and federal jury rules have to be the same, and they, neither of them have to be unanimous. You had one justice saying they can be different, and the feds have to be unanimous, and the states don't. Um, so there, you ended up having five for the position that states unanimous jury, you know, states jury verdicts don't have to be unanimous. But you had eight justices saying something else, which is the states and the feds have to have the same rule, which is not how it ended up coming out. Um, so combining these is very difficult. We also have the question of why did the chief justice reach the commerce power question if? Um, he thought that the mandate could be upheld as a tax. Normally, you don't have to go through all, I mean, all the different ways that something might be unconstitutional before you figure out that the Constitution supports it in a different way. So I want to answer this um, in two ways. So one is the question of what did the court actually hold? I don't know, honestly, as I sit before you today, what the <laughs> Marx rule would prescribe. What I do know is that on page 41, in a section of the opinion joined by five justices, the court says that it holds that the mandate can't be supported under the Commerce Clause. So I think you know, whatever authority Marx has, I think that sentence has to have at least as much authority, given that it's drawn by a majority. So we do know that the court has said something on this, namely that the, the Commerce Clause would not support the mandate. The question is then, well, why did the Chief Justice reach it in the first place? And I think the answer to that has to do with the doctrine of constitutional avoidance. That's the sort of general idea that if a certain reading of a, of a statute would be unconstitutional, that's probably not what Congress meant. Now, we use the word probably because Lord knows Congress can pass unconstitutional things, and it does all the time, and the courts have to slap them down and say no. Um, but chances are Congress didn't want to do something unconstitutional. There's a, another form of this doctrine, which I think could be sort of pejoratively called constitutional avoidance avoidance, which says that if it would even be a little iffy whether something is constitutional, then clearly they couldn't have meant that. So let's not actually try to answer the hard question of whether it's constitutional or not. Let's do something else. And I think that the difference, I, I think that the latter doctrine, which shows up in a case called Catholic bishops, and there are some other cases in that, in that vein, is not as widely accepted as just the standard picture of if we know something would be unconstitutional, we shouldn't construe it that way. I think, um, and this is not you know, merely uh, loyalty speaking, I think that the chief was right to reach the Commerce Clause issues. And the reason is as follows. The most natural reading of the statute is as a command. It places people under a legal duty to buy health insurance. Everyone is obliged, if they want to, act consistently with the laws of their country to get health insurance. That is different from a tax which says, if you go out and earn any income, you have to pay some of it to us. Um, that doesn't tell anyone that you're under a duty to go out and earn income. Um, if the most natural reading of the, of the act is as that kind of command, then it would make sense to know whether the court can uphold that kind of command. Is that command something that Congress can give you under the Constitution? Only if the answer is no, should we, only if we have to avoid interpreting it that way to avoid striking it down, do we then look to whatever other interpretations might be fairly possible? We don't just say, oh, that's a hard question. Let's see what else we can do. Because if you uphold the if you uphold the statute as a tax, what you're holding, and the Chief Justice made this very clear in a footnote, that nobody, after the decision came out, is under a legal duty to buy insurance. That's a different state of the law than the state of the law you, that you might have thought was the case when you went in. So um, the court can't just uphold something as a tax that would have been a penalty without actually changing the substance of the obligation that's placed on people. And that's why it makes sense not to do that unless they determine that the statute can't be read any other way, um, that the other reading of it would be unconstitutional. Uh, I want just very quickly to run down, sort of, if that's the case, well, what did the court say about why the, uh, the 
penalty, why the penalty as a, as a mandate, as a command, would be unconstitutional under the Commerce Clause. Um, and I think that one of the reasons it will have relatively little application in the future. This is the reasoning of the Chief Justice that was shared by the, the Joint Dissenters that um, the power to regulate commerce is not the same as the power to create commerce, which we can then regulate. Um, I think you know one can go back and forth on the merits of that argument. I think in general it's an argument that will have relatively little application. Congress doesn't try and do this sort of thing very often. There aren't going to be that many purchase mandates, frankly, coming down the pike. Um, so you know, e even if the the argument is true, and I think it does have things behind it, I'd be happy to get into that in Q and A. Um, I don't think it's going to be that influential in the law in the future. What I do think will be very interesting is the necessary and proper discussion. Because there the issue is not just can Congress do this directly, but if Congress is doing something else under its enumerated powers, like um, regulating the ability of an insurance company to deny coverage based on factors specific to you, as opposed to factors uh, relevant to the population generally, if they can do that under the commerce power, and that would cause lots of problems, namely insurance would be so expensive that no reasonable person would buy it, then can they do something else to fix that problem, namely require everyone to purchase insurance? The joint dissenters said no, but I'm not entirely sure why. Um, and I, I worry that that section of the opinion might have been written in haste. Um, they argue that it, you know, allowing Congress to do that would sort of expand their power into a broad new field. It would be so limitless that it would convert the Commerce Clause into a general authority to direct the economy. Um, that may well be true and it may well be persuasive. My worry, though, is that the one thing we know about the Necessary and Proper Clause is that it refers to powers that aren't already enumerated. That's the reason why you have it there. Um, or if they are um, already granted, they're granted only by implication, not expressly. <clears throat> so the idea that sort of, oh, this would really sort of open up the floodgates because all these things could come in that aren't written down, sort of that's what the Necessary and Proper Clause is for. Um, what I thought was very interesting, though, in the Chief Justice's opinion, was referring back to the standard that was argued extensively in McCulloch v. Maryland, the standard that people seem to be talking about most at the founding, asking whether, is this power incidental to the powers granted? If we have the power to regulate commerce, let's say by putting a minimum price on the interstate sale of sugar, then presumably there are some incidental powers that flow from that. If somebody sells sugar below the legal price, well, we can put them in jail. Um, we can make sugar dealers file reports so that we can enforce it. We can you know, figure out ways to make sure this, this law is adhered to. It's not quite so clear that the ability to do that grants you also the power to cure any problems that might later crop up. Oh, if we put a minimum price on sugar, nobody wants to use sugar anymore. Well, let's make everyone use sugar. Or let's say that we, um, you know, we, we, put a, we cap the salary of doctors so people don't want to be doctors anymore. Well, let's make people be doctors. Um, or if you uh, take another example, it would be great, it would be convenient and useful and necessary if we could import a lot of doctors from other countries that would lower the cost of health care here. But you wouldn't infer from the power to regulate commerce that therefore the federal government can also invade those countries and kidnap doctors and bring them back if we didn't also have a declare war clause in the Constitution. Um, that there are some powers that might help solve problems that other powers create but that aren't themselves separately granted, and that they're significant enough and are different enough that are the sort of thing you would expect to be spelled out. And that is the analysis that was really being used in McCulloch, and that's the analysis that the Chief Justice relied on. And I think you know, whether or not you agree with the, the ultimate conclusion that he reaches, it will be very interesting to see how in the future that attempt to ground the necessary and proper clause in somewhat more um, traditional roots uh, will actually play out. Well, thank you, and good afternoon. It's good to be with you folks. Uh, I guess there's some interest in this decision. <laughs> I think the most important thing I have to say to you has to do with Duke against Butler. <laughs> <laughs> I would much rather be one for one in the national championship game <laughs> than 0 for 2. <laughs> what is the Affordable Care Act trying to accomplish? If you have insurance already, through your employer or through your parents for the time being, or you qualify for Medicaid or Medicare, you already have the benefit of what the Affordable Care Act is trying to extend to 40 million Americans. You don't have to worry that you're going to be denied coverage based on a pre-existing condition. You don't need to worry that you're going to be discriminated against based upon your medical history. You don't have to worry that if something unforeseen happens to you, the insurance company is going to just cancel your insurance. 
This is something that most Americans already enjoy. It's something that 30, 40 million Americans who fall in what's called the non-group market don't. It's not just them or other people. It's your parents. If one of your parents works and the other one doesn't, and the parent who works loses a job and someone gets sick. Even if you're wealthy, your family is hosed. This is a very big deal. This is a, the largest expansion of the social safety net in half a century. This is on the order of Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. And part of the New Deal settlement has been that when you have these huge economic social big deals, the presumption of constitutionality, judicial deference to Congress, to the political branches, is at its maximum. To put it differently, this is not the Gun-Free School Zones Act of 1990. This is not Section 13981 of the Violence Against Women Act of 1994. To strike down this law, in part or in whole, is the most sweeping, most consequential invalidation of a federal law on federalism grounds in 40, 50 years. Right? Those are the stakes. Uh, that was what was at stake in this case. Now, how did people think about this case at the beginning? Uh, you had, um, right, why did, why did an argument that was regarded as off the wall or frivolous at the start um, come to be regarded as not just plausible, per but persuasive, and decisive in the view of, I don't know, four and a half justices? <laughs> uh, theorists of constitutional change are going to think about this for a long time, right? How did opposition to this law uh, accomplish in two years what it took the gun rights movement, for example, 30 years? Uh, and there's a lot to be said about this. I think part of the answer has to do with opposition uh, becoming the official position of one of the two major political parties. It's not just immoral or unwise, but it's actually unconstitutional, notwithstanding the fact that we thought of it during the 1990s and introduced bills in Congress that includes individual mandates. And I think part of it has to do with political opposition um, and the controversy surrounding individual mandates um, requiring people to buy stuff they don't want, which is not what this statute does, but I'll talk about that. And I think part of it has to do with lacuna, space in the doctrine, right? a space in which you could press and try and get something. So in Lopez and Morrison and these other Commerce Plus cases, the court keeps referring to economic activity, and that's something Congress can regulate. And the whole debate in those cases was about, is it economic, is it not economic? And now the challenger said, but wait, the court said activity. And activity in activity becomes the way to attack the minimum coverage provision. So I think, uh, I think it's important to underscore the stakes. It's important to underscore how this litigation was looked at at the beginning and then what happened in a short period of time. And even in the end, uh, and this is an argument from authority, and they're perilous because we ultimately have to decide for ourselves what we think, but in the end, uh, notwithstanding what any justice did, you had uh, the prevailing professional view approaching a consensus but certainly by far the predominant view, which included every moderate or liberal legal expert I know of, a striking number of the most prominent legal conservatives in the nation, from J. Harvey Wilkinson to Charles Freed to Richard Posner to Henry Monahan to Larry Silberman to Jeff Sutton, leading lights of the Federal Society concluding that the minimum coverage provision, and indeed the statute in general, is within the scope of Congress's enumerated powers, notwithstanding how much we may not like it as a political matter. Right? So that, 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 that is how most legal experts have viewed this, although not all. Absent from this consensus are professional Republicans right, who made it their political cause, and some of the most robustly libertarian rejectors of modern constitutional law, right, who wanted to get rid of this law and a whole lot more. Not everyone. I would not put my colleague Steve Sachs in that category. I would not put my colleague Ernie Young in that category. Um, but that's what we're talking about. Now, why? Um, what, what are the actual arguments supporting this consensus? Well, let's talk a little bit about Medicaid. I agree it's the most consequential part of the opinion. The court mentioned back in 1987 in the Dole case that you'll study in con law if you haven't already, that Congress has robust power to condition federal funds on the agreement by states to do stuff they otherwise aren't required to do. In the Dole case, it was, uh, uh, it was a 21-year-old drinking age. And uh, Rehnquist wrote an opinion upholding it. It was a 7-2 decision, interesting dissents by Brennan and O'Connor, unusual, unusual bedfellows. And Rehnquist said at the end, maybe there's a point at which pressure turns into compulsion. He doesn't list coercion as a restraint, but that's not an issue here. And then 25 years go by. And it's not like the court didn't have opportunity to flesh out what it meant by coercion. It avoided the issue. 
repeatedly. In the Affordable Care Act case, it put teeth into the coercion requirement. Now, if you're like Justice Ginsburg and the other liberals on the court, and you don't see coercion as a relevant part of the, of the spending clause jurisprudence, um, then I think it's not a hard case. Right? You can say, what's coercive? This is not like taxing people or taxing their income out of existence. This is a subsidy. And if you don't want to do what the federal government wants you to do, don't take the money. So I think if you don't think coercion is a relevant constitutional value, then it's an easy case. If you do think coercion is a relevant constitutional value, and the court has said that it is after falling asleep for 25 years, right, then it becomes very difficult to explain when a very good deal, which this is for the overwhelming majority of states, and we'll see how long states like Texas, who it seems to me for political and ideological reasons, are going to remain unconcerned that 25% of the people in the state don't have basic access to health insurance. How long is ideological opposition to a law and to a president going to persist in denying people a very good deal that will give them basic access to health insurance? We'll see what's going to happen. Most experts predict that in the long run, this is such a good deal for the states, and it's going to have such an effect on their most vulnerable citizens that they'll get on board. But maybe they won't. Who knows? I think the challenge for those who believe in coercion limits, and this is my next paper, this is what I'm focusing on next, because I think it's very tricky. The question is, what is it about the Medicaid expansion and the Affordable Care Act that is unconstitutionally coercive, such that Medicaid itself is not unconstitutionally coercive, such that other kinds of conditions on federal funds in environmental laws, in civil rights laws, right, are not unconstitutionally coercive. Chief Justice Roberts, in I think the much more responsible Medicaid uh, decision, uh, in, contra in contrast to the joint dissent, talked about the huge amount of money at stake. And that does distinguish this. This is about 10 or 20 percent of state budgets. It distinguishes this program from lots of other conditional expenditures. Um, but Medicaid itself, pre-ACA, is a huge part of the state budget. All right? And so everything you said about Medicaid, it seems to me, makes a very good argument that Medicaid itself is unconstitutionally coercive. The other argument he made has to do with Medicaid one versus Medicaid two. He said that, that there's something different going on here. This is not an expansion of Medicaid. This is a fundamental change in the program. And you can't condition funds from Medicaid one on a change in Medicaid two, even as he conceded that Congress tomorrow could get rid of all of Medicaid one and two and repass it with the ACA uh, requirements to expand access up to 133% of the federal poverty level. So I think it's going to be very difficult going forward if you want to take coercion seriously in a way that doesn't blow up many federal laws, in a way that could cause a real problem for the court, striking down Medicaid itself. I think the dissent's logic, although I can't believe they actually mean it, would strike down Medicaid itself. I think Roberts is at least struggling with, with the problem. <laughs> okay, what about the minimum coverage provision, right? About, so, so, so the CBO predicts that in 10 years' time, with the Affordable Care Act, we'll have 27 million people in this country without health insurance. Not universal coverage, but getting close, right? Uh, that, that's with the Affordable Care Act. Without the Affordable Care Act, 60 million people without health insurance. About half of those who are going to get insurance are going to be through Medicaid. The other half are through the so-called individual mandate, the minimum coverage provision and shared responsibility payment, and the other provisions of the ACA that are concededly constitutional, those that guarantee access to insurance, that prohibit insurers from denying people in the non-group market coverage if they have a pre-existing condition or if they have a medical history that will be more costly for, to, uh, to insure. Right? That's the other half of the chunk, the 16 million people who will get insurance who otherwise wouldn't have it. Throughout the litigation, I think opponents of the law frame their opposition in the terms of the Commerce Clause, the language individual mandate. Right, speaks in terms of a Commerce Clause regulation as opposed to something else. In fact, uh, from the very beginning, and it's black letter law, Congress needed to go one for three. Right? It just had to show uh, to the satisfaction of five justices that the minimum coverage provision was in the scope of the tax power or the Commerce Clause or the Necessary and Proper Clause. I think the opposition focused on the Commerce Clause and I think um, won the public debate, but in the end at the Supreme Court, Right, didn't, win, uh, didn't win the argument uh, on the tax power. I've went, uh, uh, there's a lot we could talk about uh, why I think the minimum coverage revision is valid Commerce Clause legislation. Uh, there's also a lot we can say about the necessary and proper clause. Uh, I agree with Professor Sachs that the limit the court imposes on the Commerce Clause, no purchase mandate, is going to have very little effect going forward. And I would suggest that has been the point all along. The point of this distinction was to kill this law. <laughs> 
The point of this distinction was not to save the republic from purchase mandates that have never been imposed before and will never be imposed again. Right? Political reality explains why Congress has not been in the business of forcing people to buy broccoli or buy wheat when there are other ways to accomplish regulatory objectives. So I don't think that's going to have much effect going forward. That was never the point. Right? The point was to kill this law, not to impose a significant limit, meaningful limit on the scope of the Commerce Clause. The Necessary and Proper Clause, I don't know what to make of it. I mean, Chief Justice Roberts, unlike the four dissenters, recently joined Justice Breyer's very robust interpretation of the Necessary and Proper Clause in a case called U.S. against Comstock. Um, yes, he references the language in McCulloch about great substantive and independent powers versus, um, right, versus um, what's the word you used? Incidental. Uh, incidental powers, right? Uh, that language has not been used or employed by the court in a very long time. I can't believe that he really means it uh, and that we're going to get into the business of distinguishing this. Congress has the power to establish a uniform rule of naturalization. Deporting people is incidental to that? Congress has the power to put all kinds of people in jail for violating all kinds of enumerated powers. Those are all necessarily incidental. The minimum coverage provision, which is a means to the end of guaranteeing people insurance without blowing up insurance markets, that's a great and substantive and independent power, not an incidental one. Right? Not at all clear why that's the case or how you would apply it. Why is deporting people incidental? Why is chartering a bank incidental? People like to pick out language and martial opinions that say, of course, the, the, the enumeration presupposes something not enumerated. But the great thrust and force of the opinion is a nationalist vision of robust federal power and a court that will defer to Congress. The Constitutional Convention considered giving the national government, Congress, the power to charter corporations, the power to, to uh, have a national bank. And they didn't bring it to a vote because they were concerned that it would be defeated. The framers were very skeptical of corporations. Now reconcile that with an originalist view of First Amendment and campaign finance reform, but that's another panel. <laughs> so the idea that chartering, that chartering a national bank is an incidental and not great substantive and independent, but a minimum coverage provision which allows Congress to carry into execution provisions of the law that are not even being challenged, not at all clear to me. Lastly, the tax power. Um, I disagree that Congress, uh, that Roberts had to rewrite the statute. I also disagree, by the way, that we should be very concerned about justices who are being bullied as if Roberts cares what I or anyone else thinks, right? And he wasn't under any pressure from the right. Um, we shouldn't be at all concerned about four conservative Republican justices who stand arm in arm in a joint dissent, giving the Republican Party exactly what they want and couldn't achieve in the political process. That doesn't call into question the, the integrity of the law politics distinction. The Chief Justice, who may have gone up to the pre precipice, thought twice about it and backed down, right, actually denying his fellow travelers, right, those who he usually uh, finds to be those who most support what he do. That somehow calls into question the integrity of the law and politics distinction. This is a tax, and it's best read as a tax because it acts like a tax. The minimum coverage provision is not a mandate. It's a modest financial incentive. It says get insurance or pay a certain amount of money to the IRS each year. And you know what? You don't got to pay that much. It's about $700 get insurance or pay about 700 bucks. It is a modest financial incentive. If the law said get insurance or pay 7,000 bucks or get insurance or pay 20,000 bucks, that is not a tax. That is a penalty. That is the Commerce Clause or the Necessary and Proper Clause or nothing. The difference between a tax and a penalty, and this is exactly what Robert said, sounds in coercion and therefore revenue raising. Taxes dampen behavior subject to the tax. They don't tax it out of existence. That's why taxes raise revenue. They raise revenue just because they dampen the conduct subject to it. Penalties prevent most of the behavior subject to it. And it's because they prevent it that they raise little or no revenue. So when you look at the face of this statute and you look at the material characteristics, the modest size of the exaction, the fact that it's less than the cost of insurance for most people, the fact that there's no scienter requirement, the fact that there are no recidivism enhancements, this case comes out differently if Congress says, each month you go without insurance, you're going to have to pay $1,000 more. And Congress, if it tries to use the tax power to coerce people, that is beyond the scope of the tax power. If it imposes a modest financial incentive that gives people a choice, and by the way, the government's litigation position throughout has been that people do not act unlawfully. The only legal consequence of not getting insurance is having to pay this exaction. 
that's it. There's no threat of criminal prosecution, right? There's no threat of anything else. And so if it looks like a tax and acts like a tax and walks like a tax for constitutional purposes is a tax, notwithstanding the facts that Congress didn't use the T word. Congress didn't use the magic words. Now, in terms of concerns about political accountability, everyone thought it was a tax and now we've been duped, really? Who escaped political accountability? Are people confused now that the Republicans did this to us? Or that it was Obama and the Democrats? Did Obama say it wasn't a tax or did he say it wasn't a tax increase? And we can debate about whether a financial incentive to engage or not engage in certain behavior is a tax increase. We can certainly have that conversation. Nonetheless, it is the case that the Democrats in Congress avoided calling it a tax, and they seem to avoid calling it a tax for political reasons. And my response to that is, so what? Since when is the court in the business of policing political accountability in the tax code? Have you looked at the tax code lately? <laughs> if you want to take seriously the idea of a policing accountability in the tax code, then it seems to me you have a massive judicial expedition in which domestic expenditures are unconstitutional because they're labeled military expenditures. Because all kinds of spending is buried in the tax code as opposed to being exposed in the budget. Right? If you want to take seriously the idea of political accountability in the tax code, then it seems to me you've got to invalidate much more than the minimum coverage provision, which turns on a subtle distinction between a tax and a penalty. And I think before this case, no justice <clears throat> other than John Roberts understood what it entailed. Excellent. So I hope the court's taking notes because we covered all the major issues in the ACA in about 45 minutes, um, not in four days. Um, we're going to do a little Q&A now. I'll start things off. If you guys have questions, just raise your hands and I'll call on you. Um, I'll start off maybe just by throwing a question to the panel. Um, this is about the spending clause, which you all agreed was the most consequential uh, part of the decision, at least going forward. Um, and I just had a two-part question about that. One is that the Medicaid statute, when it was initially passed, had this language in it that Congress reserved the power to, and I had the opinion, so I just look this back up, to the right to alter, amend, or repeal any provision of Medicaid. So I wonder why that doesn't answer the, it's not anything new, it's just part of the deal that was agreed to in the first place. Um, which is something that we, we, we had discussed here. This is, by the way, a little bit of statutory construction to go along with all of our con law discussion here. And the second is, I wonder the degree to which that decision, like the Commerce Clause decision, isn't actually going to mean much going forward because, for exactly the reasons you mentioned, the sort of the green eye shade reasons, right? That this is 20, 10 to 20%, I think, was a number that Professor Siegel threw out. Um, uh, uh, yeah, this is unique in the way that compelling activity is probably unique. So are we really, really likely to see a lot of difference in um, uh, future outlays, as you put it? So I'll just throw that to the panel. And you guys, when you have questions, raise your hand, and I'll call it. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take the first crack at, crack at that. This is, is the first part of your question. I, I think I think, as you know, when, when Congress exercises spending power and, and a state accepts funds, it's really, uh, it's really in the nature of a contract in which you have, you know, sort of, you know con consideration and you must have sort of knowing acceptance of, of a benefit. And what, what the court had and what held, and what I, what, what I think actually works here is that the expansion required by the Affordable Care Act was of such a degree in kind, su such a change, that um, you could reasonably conclude that a state did not knowingly enter into that contractual arrangement. It is absolutely correct to say that Congress has, between you know 1965 and the Affordable Care Act, you know changed, you know changed Medicaid, you know uh, added some obligations on the states. I think what we saw with the ACA was just of such a degree in magnitude um, uh, that the court, I think. Was, was correct to, to invalidate it on, on those grounds. And if you, you know, talk about individual states, in my home state of Indiana, um, I think the estimates were you know, $3 billion in new spending, spending over like a five-year time period. Well, that, that's a significant chunk of change uh, you know, for, a, for a state that size. As to the second part of your question, I mean, that, that um, just really remains to be seen. I think some, some of our... Um, I think this November and November's after that will have a, have, a, have, a, have a lot to say about whether we see this type of legislation going forward or not. I mean, I will say that we are already seeing attempts to try to use the Supreme Court's decision um, to invalidate um, you know, congressional action. I think uh, some of us were talking earlier. In o Oklahoma has filed a lawsuit um, challenging the Department of Treasury regulation um, that would implement the Affordable Care Act based on basically this coercion type of theory. So um, I do think we'll I do think we'll see I think we'll see a lot of lawsuits filed um, under this theory. Now, how many actually succeed? Well, that, that's an open question. I don't know the difference between an expansion of an old program and the creation of a new one. Right? I don't know why what I thought was the Medicaid expansion is in fact not a Medicaid expansion. It's Medicaid two. <laughs> 
And my fear is that you're going to have smart lawyers playing games with words, right, and characterizing and recharacterizing programs. But I think the stakes are enormous. Right? Recipients of federal funds are not allowed to discriminate based on various characteristics, like race, right, like gender. So if Congress adds sexual orientation to these federal civil rights laws, which are spending clause statutes, is that now a fundamental change in the nature of the program, in which case it's invalid under the spending clause, or is it an expansion of an old program that protects us against discrimination based upon various prohibited characteristics? That's one of many examples of the kind of lawsuits that are going to be filed. So I, I should say that um, the whether, whether or not this uh, plan was actually coercive, I find a very difficult question to answer for the reasons that Professor Siegel has explained. That said, I think it is worth to note that it got seven votes, um, including from people like Justice Breyer, the author of Comstock, who are not exactly uh, often very worried about the expansion of federal power. Um, I think that the fact may be that this was in some sense a one-off. Um, this is not the kind of decision that will come down the pike very often. On the other hand, it doesn't necessarily mean, therefore, that the decision was made to order. It could just be that this was a big one, and you don't see big ones very often. I think the kind of law that would get Justice Breyer and Justice Kagan to say, oh, no, no, no this really is too coercive to stand, um, has to be pretty significant. And even if it isn't, in fact, repeated, that doesn't mean that the principle isn't, in fact, out there, that there are certain limits to what the federal government can do with its spending. But query, would Breyer or Kagan have been the fifth vote to invalidate the Medicaid expansion, as opposed to the sixth or the seventh? Who knows? I wondered that. We'll take, we'll take an answer from the audience on that one. <laughs> or, or, or any other questions. Just raise your hand. I get in the middle there. <clears throat> Dan. Professor Siegel, could you address what Professor Sachs said about whether it was proper for the court to address the Commerce Clause issue? It's the one thing I didn't say that I wanted to. So I'm so <laughs> glad. But I'm not even paying you. Uh, uh, I disagree with, with, with my colleague, Professor Sachs. I think if you really want to talk about what's law and what's something else, I think Roberts misapplied the canon of constitutional avoidance. Right? I think he upheld the minimum coverage provision under the tax power because it reasonably could be so upheld. He said that he had to first invalidate it under the commerce and necessary and proper clauses in order to reach the tax power. Now, consult Hart and Wexler, right? which you haven't been exposed to. You will if you take federal courts with me in the spring. Please do. In the 19th century, that is very solid legal reasoning. That's the traditional canon of constitutional avoidance, which is you have to first decide that the first best reading of the statute renders it unconstitutional to reach the second. Modern avoidance, which begins with Ashwander and Justice Brandeis and, right, and a whole series of much more modern opinions, says, no, we want to avoid constitutional invalidations, right, not pursue them. And so all Roberts needed to do was to have constitutional doubts, or if you want, substantial constitutional doubts, before he retreats to the second best reading and upholds it under the tax power. Now, he is a really, really good lawyer. He knew what he was doing. Uh, so the question is, why did he do this? He didn't say he was rejecting modern avoidance in favor of old avoidance. He didn't say, now there are legal explanations. Maybe he thought uh, we all needed to know where the court stood. But if you actually agree with Professor Sachs and me that we're not going to see more purchase mandates, that doesn't seem right. Um, if he doesn't like modern avoidance and there have been lots of criticism of it, um, then maybe he owed us an explanation that he was changing course. Is it just old avoidance for this case only? That seems hard to square with the requirement that judges discipline themselves to the virtue of consistency. Um, why did he reach the commerce and necessary and proper clause parts of uh, the case when he didn't have to? I think those on the left who see political partisanship will say he did it because he really wanted to, and he wanted to head on the side he was disappointing in victory. I'm not actually persuaded by that. Um, I, I, I think it's more a, a case of statesmanship than partisanship. Right? I think that um, I think he sees uh, he sees value uh, value that helps to sustain uh, the political foundations of the rule of law of not just handing a complete victory to one side. Uh, I think. Uh, validating the sincerely held moral, constitutional, symbolic beliefs of one side, those who balked at the idea of Congress requiring people to buy stuff, right? Um, it seems to me, on grounds of statesmanship and not just partisanship, interpreting the opinion in a way that can try to maintain some semblance of solidarity amidst intense disagreements, incorporating the views and values of those who vehemently oppose the ACA, that to me is, I think, a more charitable and and in my view, more persuasive explanation. But I don't think the strictly legal explanation that this is good technical legal analysis uh, 
um, is, is persuasive to me. So if anything, I, I'd like to defend the Chief Justice against the villainous charge of being a statesman. <laughs> um, I, I, I think, uh, you know, I was saying or doing last night that, um, you know, the one, not having any inside knowledge whatsoever on, in, in this thought process, the one thing I can say, reading the opinion, is that this is a very chiefy opinion. Um, there are ways that are sort of hard to articulate um, if, if, you know, other than having worked for him, but sort of his fingerprints are on every sentence um, in, this, in this opinion. It's clearly one that he spent a lot of time um, sort of crafting and recrafting. And I think that we should not too quickly jump to the conclusion that, that if something's in there, it's not because he actually thought it was correct. Um, the, a lot of the question of sort of can you reach this issue, do you have to, depends on how significant you think the difference is between the penalty and the tax. Uh, Professor Siegel has articulated a theory in which it's not, you know, a terribly significant distinction, um, at least in, in this context, the sort of difference between having a $700 penalty and a $700 tax. I think one thing that's important to note is that the section imposing the obligation, um, imposing, it says this group of people, you have to buy health insurance. Next section is this smaller subgroup of people, if you don't buy health insurance as you were required to under the first provision, then you have to pay a penalty. Um, and I think that it is quite plausible to interpret the first provision as saying, no, everyone in that bigger group has to do it. Um, you can imagine a law that would be passed that would say it is the duty of every American to salute the flag and worship at the Roman Catholic Church, period. No, no penalty, nothing else. I think everyone would agree that that's unconstitutional, that the government can't put that kind of duty on us. Um, but it's not unconstitutional because of anything it actually causes to change in your life in the sense that no, no government officer is going to go after you. The, the Holmesian bad man would just sort of ignore that that kind of statute had been passed because how does it affect him? Um, but I think that that's not necessarily how we view the law. And so if you're going to say, in fact, the court is going to strike down the duty that everyone has been placed under to actually buy health insurance, that does make enough of a difference. And maybe you have to know that it's unconstitutional first. So I saw a few more hands, and we have a minute or two, so we'll do kind of lightning round uh, here. Purple shirt. Uh, can you give an example of a purchase mandate that couldn't be structured in a way to uh, be constitutionally solved by the taxing clause? Yeah, I mean, I, I did, right? I would get insurance or pay $10,000 a year. And you, what you do is you make, you, you make it so financially onerous not to comply with the condition, right, that almost everyone, if not everyone, has to comply with it. After Lopez, the Gun-Free School Zones Act case in which the court strikes down a federal law uh, which pr prohibits possession of a gun in the school zone for the first time since 1937. Imagine after Lopez, Congress passes the Gun-Free School Zones tax and says, of course you can carry a gun in the school zone. This is America, right? But if you do and if we catch you, you're going to have to pay $25,000. And the next time you're going to have to pay $50,000. And then after that, it's going to go up to $100,000. I submit that even if Congress uses capital T, capital A, capital, there's no way this court is going to uphold that as a tax. It's not a tax. It's a penalty, right? It is so coercive um, that it gives no one, or, or no one short of Warren Buffett, right, a reasonable choice but to comply. So on the thought of Warren Buffett walking armed through schools, um, <laughs> maybe a good time to end and thank our panelists and our hosts. That's really good. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.